speaker is Daryl Budge. Daryl's just getting the screen up and running. Um, Daryl is also the WA State Director of Family Voice Australia. Again, we've known Daryl for some time and uh, we look forward to what Daryl's going to say. Thank you, Daryl. Thanks everyone for coming out. I'm sorry we're running half an hour late, but that's just the way things go in these kind of events. So um, I just want to run through some of what's happening with these amendments, but first of all, we'll just uh, cover first. The Family Law Act is actually only applies to married couples. It doesn't apply to de facto's and to other unmarried uh, arrangements. So what this act will change is mainly those arrangements made in married couples. However, of course, this Family Law Act then gets incorporated into the other acts that are in WA that deal with unmarried and de facto couples. So there's cross references between both of them and obviously it will have a, a broader impact. This is where the Family Law Court actually sits and actually the Family, law, family Court of WA is a less adversarial environment and then the Federal Fed Family Court of Australia is fairly adversarial and the Family Magistrates Court operates over East. It's very adversarial. So this is the way kind of where it sits in its structure. There's a story that was actually shared on the Family Voice Facebook page after I shared a, a video of myself with Augusto and Clint and Court uh, speaking through these, this particular act. And this lady responded to that video on the Family Voice Facebook page and she says, I have a lived experience as a mother of all sides in this discussion, a horror story. False restraining orders are very common. I would argue less commonly granted on need or on the basis of truthful testimony. The expanded definition of what constitutes family violence is far too broad and open to interpretation. Many restraining orders are needed, but what victims often need more is witness protection. Restraining orders, the silent treatment when used as weapons, are a very serious form of family violence, which goes completely unpunished and unrecognised. False allegations run rife in family court and are used to cut off contact with safe and loving mothers and fathers. And this is the experience of many people, is that a claim can be made and it's not actually cross-referenced or cross-examined very well. Compared to the outcomes of those who spend 1 to 34% of nights with their father or had daytime only care, the a Australian Institute of Family uh, Studies did an evaluation of these reforms that instituted the shared parental um, responsibility provision that was put into the Act in 2006. The review, what was the outcome? Those that went into shared care time arrangements, children's outcomes were similar or marginally better. So it was actually produced positive outcomes according to the most long-term review of the 2006 reforms. While children, of course, who never saw their father appeared to be far worse. So the government knows that this shared parental um, responsibility arrangements has a positive effect, has a markedly positive effect. And they found that Analysis of court files found that just over one in four fathers were seeking to have equal care time arrangements. And what this did, this, this shared parental responsibility provision put in there, it motivated people in the family relationship professional sector when they were getting counselling and, and pre-court orders, it motivated them to come to arrangements that were developmentally appropriate for children. There was a lot of creative thinking because it was there in the law, this is what we need to do, shared parental responsibility. People came up with arrangements before they got to court, because they knew if they, once they got to court, it would be ordered anyway. So it actually had a very, very good positive effect. However, when it gets to court, in the adversarial system, because evidence isn't checked, the legal framework, the family lawyers said that the legal framework didn't facilitate the arrangements that were appropriate because of the complicated nature of the current law because of the way it's arranged, because the adversarial arrangement, the punitive arrangements where some claim can be made and punitive action is taken directly against the other party, that basically you can't see your kids and all those kinds of things. So that's the, that's the way it kind of functions. But this lady's story continues. She wrote quite a long comment, so I just split it up a bit. There are no consequences for false allegations and falsely obtained restraining orders despite the trauma and harm they cause the innocent victim. Children are influenced, they're manipulated, and often even threatened and bribed to align with an abusive parent. Because once, if they, they don't have any contact with their child for six months, a year, two years, the child says, well, I, I'm with my mum, I don't want anything different now. So when the court asks, that's the arrangement that stays. 
And that's supposedly the best interest of the child. So this is the way it happens. This is what parental alienation is. It's backed by scientific research, particularly in the last four or five years, and it causes serious and often irreparable damage to families, parents, and children. Parental alienation is severe, intimate partner violence. But the way we've defined family violence doesn't include this. And there's no penalty for preventing kids from seeing their father or their mother. The Australian Institute of Family Studies survey of separated parents found that only 9% had equal time with both parents. It's an incredible statistic. Only 7%, and 7%, only 7 had more time with their father than with their mother. 46% of children spend the majority with their mother and, uh, and, the, and the smaller, more frequent visitation with their father. So almost half are basically spending most of their time, 80%, 70% of their time with their mother and very little time with their father. But there is some kind of point here. If, if over 80% actually avoided mediation or counselling or family dispute, so all those people that actually avoided going to court they can avoid these kinds of outcomes if they just deal with the issues themselves. And actually, they will get a good, positive outcome. Only 9% of all actual family violence disagreements and these kind of disputes actually end up in court. It's a very, very small percentage of all the disputes that happen. So what we need to do as a society is think about how can we address things from a non-legal way to deal with things? Because it is a moral issue. Parties are disagreeing and lying to each other and deceiving each other and not doing the right things by each other. We need to deal with it in a Christian aspect. Churches and people that you know Christ, you know what's truth, you know compassion and love and care, and you demonstrate it in your churches. But so let's have a look at the, the Act. What, they're, what, they're, what are they proposing to remove? There's three major changes I want to cover. They're removing the detailed objects that are there in the Act. It's very, very detailed long discussion about what are the objects of the Act. They're repealing this presumption of equal shared parental responsibility, along with that, as, as Phil mentioned, the substantial and significant time provisions, and also major changes to the best interests of the child. So, first of all, the new objects of the Act are extremely brief now. They used to be quite long. The objects of the part are just to ensure the best interests of the child are met, and referring to the Convention of the Rights of the Child. So. Part B was already in the Act. Part A replaces all of that. So all of that is now taken out in the object. So this is somewhat duplication from the best interests of the child later on in the Act. But these objects are very careful because they provide the court with guidance about we want to think about what is in the best interest of the child, what's the best interest of the parent, what's the capacity of the parent, how much involvement has the parent got in the child's life, all of those kinds of things. And all their, uh, joint, their, their parents jointly share duties and responsibilities concerning the care. All of that is there in the objects. So and they've basically removed all of that. Secondly, they're removing this equal responsibility, the presumption of equal shared parental responsibility. The Act already specified that this presumption does not explicitly mean the presumption of the shared amount of time that the, spent, the child spends equal amounts of time with both parents. But parents were coming to court with confusion, thinking equal shared parental responsibility means equal shared time. So that it, when it gets to this adversarial stage in the court, parents were arguing tooth and nail, saying, I must have equal shared time. But the court was saying, sorry, you don't have the capacity to do so, or there's abuse and other conditions, other things that we need to bring up. And so they were saying, and but they will continue, and they will continue fighting in the court for months, years on end. So what the, the people are arguing is, we need to take all of this out, rather than simply clarify so, because there's too many people arguing for too long. So all we need to do is just have them better guidance rather than remove all these positions, um, these provisions. This is what um, what we have. They are at Australian Law Reform Commission actually stated in 2019. We've got this confusion. We need to redraft it. One section that talks about joint decision making on major long-term issues. We redraft that to make that very clear. This is all we're talking about: joint major decision making on major long-term issues. But then when they came to this draft bill, that's not even in there. This recommendation from 2019 is not there. 
and they then decide to omit all of the sections that even deal with equal share parental responsibility. They're all cut out. Omit this, omit that, omit it. And then change number three is they're cutting back on the best interests factors that are considered by the court. The existing section there has two primary considerations and then 13 additional considerations and any other circumstances that they think relevant. And then their proposed section then collapses all of those things into a very short list. So this is the new shorter list. And one of the things that I find very interesting is it cuts out anything of discussion about how much involvement has the parent existing got with the child. It only considers the arrangements that produce the best for the safety of the child. And, and there's, there's a presumption that basically we're only thinking about the care of the child, not about the parent's rights. And it's resumed in this proposed draft that parental rights have to be subsumed under what is the best interest of the child. But that's very much a very subjective thing. It's extremely subjective. What is the best interest of the child? That's subject to the bias of the particular judge of the day. Very, very biased. Um, so, and they talk about the benefit to the child of a relationship with both the child's parents, but it doesn't actually specify how strong that benefit needs to be. The old best interest section had two primary considerations, that we have the benefit of the child to have a meaningful relationship with both the child's parents, that language is not there anymore. The need to protect the child from physical or psychological harm, that language is preserved. And then there's, there's additional best interests and there's quite a long list. Um, and you'll see that they, they talked about the, the extent at which the child's parents has fulfilled or failed to fulfill the parents' obligations to maintain the child in relationship and care for the child. <coughs> And they talk about the practical difficulty and expense of a child spending time or communicating with the parent and all that kind of stuff. And also the maturity, sex, lifestyle, background of the child and the child's interests, etc. So it deals with very, very detailed nature. And they, they were arguing this is too many factors and they're going to be arguing too long about all of these things. But the thing is, these factors are quite important for a court to consider. They actually stop bias by the judge or by the court to be introduced in this, in this action. So... What, a, what we see is if people actually work it through in discussion, you find if you know, 80, 90 plus percent of people end up deciding, this is a survey of all the people who are in child support across five years. And the majority of people end up, never actually end up in court. And these are the outcomes for most of those people. But when you look at people who end up in court over five years, this red line, it flutters down to 60% that are actually quite satisfied with the outcomes in regards to them and their child. So we move from good outcomes when it comes to lots of discussion, we're working out together, and then we end up in mediation, in counselling, worse outcomes. We end up in mediation, worse outcomes. We end up in court, the worst outcomes. So we as a society, as Christians, people thinking about this issue, we consider what can we do to intervene in people's lives so that we draw them back and say, look, when you end up in court, you end up with pretty poor outcomes. So we as, as Christians relating, putting on seminars, putting on talks, uh, Clive Pawson's church is going to be putting on some things with a psychologist soon, and other churches are putting on events. Put on things that you know you can talk with people and actually share Christian principles about relationships. And that's how we can draw it away from what the world does is says it's put up millions of laws because we're such sinners and we don't know how to deal with each other. We've got to have punitive laws on everything. But what really, I mean, the Old Testament model was basically if somebody is in a, in a relationship breakdown, a simple certificate of divorce, you're free to go away, you're free to find another relationship. And that's barely any kind of um, long term. And the community handled all those other issues. There wasn't so much of this punitive action. That's the issue that we have. So I want you to consider what does the church need to do in response? I'll invite you to go and give your submission. Uh, one of part of Augusto's talk was actually there in an article on our website, familyvoice.org.au slash news. You'll find some of the points he shared tonight. You'll find a link to how to submit if you don't know how to go. I would invite you to um, have a look at the newsletter on your table and have a read of that. That's Family Voices. Um, publication. We do one of those every two months. 
and you can actually get it delivered to you and your letterbox. And I'd invite you to, if you want to, donate to Family Voice. It would be great to support us and what we do. So um, hopefully that's given you a fairly clear outline on what's changing in this act and what you can do in your submission. Thanks, everyone.